Welcome to our Bible study. This is Lesson 17 of the Bible Prophecy in the Book of Revelation by Dr. Bill Waddell. Welcome back. We are uh, getting back to the regular people now. Those that are leaving are leaving. Well, not all of them yet, but uh, it'll be back to just us chickens before too long. Who we call in regular, right? Yeah. We're in Revelation 11. I'm sorry, 12. Chapter 12. Chapter 12 is, is a shorter chapter, but it is one of the more difficult chapters. Because now for the first time, since chapter 4, really, John has been seeing these things. He says, write down the things that you have seen, the things which are and will be. So for the first time, John is going to be told to write down things that are actually signs. Up until this point, like I said, our typical, uh, typical, the, the, not so much typical, but the, the mistaken interpretation of Revelation is to interpret all this as some kind of sim symbolism stuff. And uh, you don't have permission to do that. And it's not permission granted by me or not granted or disgranted by me. It's actually because the text itself, I mean, you're going to do actual hermeneutics and really follow the context, then you have to say up until this point, we've not had anything that's symbolic, really. I mean, you can say there's some, some majority of stuff has been literal. A literal star falling from heaven and on a third of the fresh water, yep. Literal third of the sea turned into blood, yep. I mean, we don't have another option, guys, that the Scripture doesn't allow us to. God doesn't come, he's not, he's not relying upon our brain power to figure out what's going on here. He tells us what it is. Or he tells us what it isn't. So for the first time here in, in Revelation, since chapter 4, we're going to be told that John, what he sees are signs. So now uh, we have permission, if you will, to speculate in the sense of those signs. It still won't be speculating. So. But we'll, we'll get to that. Let's, let's pray together. And uh, let's, let's jump into this. God, we're thankful that you lead us into all truth and you've given us your Holy Spirit to do that. And... Um, we submit ourselves to you, God. We know that you've given us your word because you want us to understand who you are. You want us to understand who we are. You want us to understand what's going on in our world around us. Lord, I pray that we would see it through the lens of your word. And Lord, we pray for, as it is a lens for us, you'd help us to focus that lens. And uh, more than anything, to be drawn into a deeper relationship with you, deeper uh, fear, a deeper respect, a deeper love, uh, a deeper service. Pray, God, your blessings over those who are traveling already today and who are traveling, leaving out tomorrow. Lord, we just pray, God, your watch, care over them, your blessings to them and their churches wherever they go. Thank you again for this time, and we just pray your blessings on it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at chapter 12. We won't read the whole thing. We're not going to go over the whole thing tonight, tonight because it's pretty, it's pretty uh, it opens up a lot of doors, a lot of stuff, a lot of rabbits to chase. But uh, chapter 12, Revelation. And uh, here the revelation takes a break. So we finished the seven, seven horns. We finished the seven seals. We finished the seven horns. We haven't started the seventh bowl, seven bowls, but the, it's just taking a break. It's not a parenthesis at all. It's just a break uh, to make sure that we're caught up on all the stuff that we need to be caught up on. What's going to happen in Revelation 12 is not just giving us a picture of what's happening in the seven year tribulation. It's giving us a picture of what has happened since the beginning of time up until the seven-year tribulation. Fills in some gaps that maybe we didn't know or maybe weren't real clear on, and so we'll be seeing these things. Verse 1, it says, And a great sign, mark that carefully, now you've been released to call this a sign. Nothing else has been allowed you to do this up until this point. Appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. What is this? Or who? And she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign, mark it carefully, appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Ladies, you thought you had a hard time in the delivery room. Mm. This woman got the devil in there with her, <laughs> it seems. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. 
And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So this child sits on the throne of God. He's going to rule all the nations. Mark it carefully, not just the Jews. All the nations. There's coming a king from God who will rule. As, as, if, if, as we get to it, you'll see he's Jewish. Who is going to rule the entire earth, not just the Jews. The entire earth. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for her, that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days. We've already been introduced to this time period. We know that's exactly three and a half years to the day. So how does this fit in with end times? Where does, which three and a half years? Like I said, you have seven years with two, two three and a half year periods to choose from. Where does this fit? And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels waging, waging war with the dragon. We've already been introduced to Michael back in, in Daniel and other places. Michael is the archangel. And his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels are waging war. Notice where they're fighting. They're in heaven. Hmm. And they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So now we, already know, who, now we know who this dragon is. I don't have to speculate. We know who he is. He's the devil. He's Satan. Lucifer. He deceives the whole world. He's thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So now we know he's got angels with him. We've already talked about this before, but Satan is not an angel. Satan is a super class of angel, I guess you could say. He's a cherubim. He has a, they have a different function. Angel literally means messenger. Cherubims aren't messengers. They have a specific guardian type of function. You see them in the Garden of Eden. You see them around the throne of God. And otherwise, you see him in this, in this depicted here as Satan. So, so what is all this? So this is tough stuff, or it can be, especially if we don't know what we're doing or especially if we don't obey the rules. And uh, not obeying the rules has led to massive misinterpretations of this chapter. Possibly, uh, certainly the, the, the biggest interpret, misinterpretations you find in Revelation and possibly the entire Bible. And this thing has just been butchered. And uh, some of it is due to the fact of just simple, simply not knowing what you're doing or what people not knowing what they were doing. And otherwise, it was done because there was a, there was a bent to it. And I told you this morning, if you want to know what happens to sinful people, follow their heart, follow the money. So, and the heart always follows the money or the money always follows the heart. I don't know which one it is, but they always find them together. So there was a, there was a financial reason why this was misinterpreted, at least in the early church. Uh, part, part of this is due to what is called the replacement theology. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a theology that came up in the Middle Ages, uh, invented by the church, which was all, we were all Catholic back then. I don't know if you, any Catholics here. We were all Catholics. You know, they didn't have Baptists back then, didn't have Mennonites, didn't have Methodists, didn't have whatever church you're from, Presbyterian, whatever you were. They didn't have them. If you were, if you were, church, if you were in a church at all, you were Christian at all, of any form, fashion, or you know, whether true, born again or not, irregardless of that, uh, you were Catholic. And the Catholic Church, because it had massive temporal holdings and powerful, it held, it held th hundreds of thousands of acres. They had a tremendous amount of wealth. Uh, they had say over kings, and they had all kinds of stuff. And they had to somehow justify this when the majority of the Scripture spoke against it. So the way they justify this is they came up with this replacement theology that somehow the church had replaced Israel. Israel has temporal blessings promised them. God promised them that they would be wealthy and healthy. I mean, physically healthy, physically wealthy, and that they were to possess a certain amount of land. So the church, in order to justify their possession of wealth and wanting of health and their possession of land, decided that they replaced Israel. And uh, we've already been through the covenants, and we've seen that you, there's just not a replacement there that's not possible. But nonetheless, it, it became uh, attractive, like I said, because people were greedy. Like I said, follow the heart, follow the money. And so they came up with this interpretation in the Middle Ages, and it became, became sort of the position of the church, including the Protestant churches, uh, for a very long time. And some of the Protestant churches, including Catholic Church, still fight this kind of, kind of thought. Uh, but they skip over the fact that Jesus promises that the church in this world, you will have trouble. Never promised that to the Jews. Jews were promised ten poor blessings, not the church. Not the church. Just sorry. It doesn't. Not many want. He just doesn't promise it. I mean, can the church be blessed? Yes, it can. But he doesn't owe it that to us. He didn't make any kind of promises to that effect. So not unlike Israel, that is. This chapter is not sequential. It is basically a recap of a broader picture being played out truly since the beginning of time. 
And that's what, that, that's what we see here. There's not just a, it's not just an end times thing happening here. It's basically an explanation of stuff so that you will understand better what's happening in the end times. Verse 1 there, uh, consider the details. Let's, let's go back and look at that again. So, so this great sign appeared in heaven, a woman. And first of all, we know it's not a real woman. How do we know that? Because it, what it said, it's a sign. So we automatically know whatever interpretation that says this is an actual living, breathing woman. Nope, can't do that. That has been eliminated. It is not literal. He tells us there, don't do that. Not literal, you can't take it that way. So whatever it is, she isn't an actual entity, a singular entity like a, like a human being. This great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed in the sun. What is that? Well, of course, we know what the sun is. The moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 st stars. And I've told you before in Revelation, there's almost nothing new in it. There's almost nothing new. It's been recodified and reorganized, but basically what you have in Revelation, especially when you get to these difficult passages, has already been told us in the Scriptures. There's already an explanation somewhere else. So when we come to difficult passage of Revelation, we need to automatically think, God has already told us about this somewhere else in the Bible. Let's go find it. And in fact, if we go somewhere else, we'll find a very interesting story in Genesis chapter 37. Of course, in Genesis 36 and 37, you have the story beginning in 36 and 37. You have the story of a young man by the name of Joseph who has 11 brothers, right? And he begins to have these dreams, these grandiose ideas. And he begins, you know, like a big dummy, to tell these dreams to his brothers. And like I said, like a big dummy because they make his brothers look bad and they make him look good. And, of course, he's the favored son. You have all this kind of... Uh, uh, problems in the family, dysfunction and all this, because you got favoritism, you have a favorite wife, you have a favorite son, you have all this mess. And like I said, uh, Jerry Springer didn't start in the 1980s. It's been around for a very long time. He has two dreams. One of them is a dream where he's, they're out binding sheaves of grain, and his sheaf stands up, and the 11 sheaves of his brothers bow down to his sheaf. He tells his brothers that. Basically says, and he interprets on his dream, basically said, I'm going to rule over you. So this little 13-year-old tells you he's going to rule over the 23-year-old brother. Right? They, would, they didn't take that very well. Let's just say that. He has a second dream, and now he relates that dream to his dad. His dad is Jacob. His dad's name's been changed to Israel. He's the father of all the Israelis. He's, he's the progenitor of all the tribes of Israel. Very important who he is. So watch what happens as he relays this dream that he has. At, that ain't it. Where am I? Hang on, there it is. And I will make... That ain't it either. That's it. Behold... Forget those others. Behold, I have had yet another dream. This is Joseph speaking to his dad, Jacob, Israel. And behold, notice, the sun... Oh, wait a minute. And the moon... Wait a minute. And the 11 stars, go back to what that says here. <laughs> Great sign appeared, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head she had how many stars? 12. Uh-oh, maybe it's fallen through. Nope, it hasn't. Yet another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. What does that mean? Well, now Jacob, Jacob is, is not a bad, he's, not, he's a pretty sharp character. He's got a lot of gifts from God. And this son, Joseph, becomes a dream interpreter, but he gets it from Dad. Dad knows how to interpret dreams. And the Jews are well known for that. Of course, Daniel's famous for that. Jacob's famous for that. Uh, Joseph is famous for that. In fact, that's how he gets to where he is, his position in Egypt, if you will call. What is this dream that you have had, son? Jacob speaking to his son, Joseph. Am I, notice his interpretation, and your mother and your brothers, how many brothers did he have? 11. He was the 12th, was he not? Because there's 12 tribes of Israel, right? Okay. Actually going to bow down to you to the ground before you, he's interpreted that dream. And when he does that, he's interpreted who this woman is. Who is this woman? The sun, right? Jacob. The moon, Jacob's wives. And the 12 stars, Jacob's 12 sons. Who's this woman? Like I said, she's not a literal woman. We've known that. Because it says it's a sign. Who is this woman? She's Israel. That's who she is. She's Israel. She's, she's this symbolic representation. So we're introduced to this fourth, or I should say at this point, third female personage. We're going to see a fourth one, the woman that rides the beast, the great harlot is the fourth 
female personage. But here we have this third female personage we're introduced to. We're introduced to the, to the Jezebel there in chapter 2 of Revelation, this woman who is ruling the church at Thyatira. Uh, we're introduced to the bride of Christ, of course. She's both there in the early first two chapters, and she's going to be in the last chapter or so. And then uh, we're introduced to this woman, this woman who is, uh, as we find out now, who is the, the, it is, happens to be Israel. And see, without this perspective, we sit around and wonder, what could this be? If you, don't, if you go and start just talking about what do you think this could be, we can come up with all kinds of conclusions. And again, what happens is, is we begin to be led by our heart, and we begin to be led by money. And we come up with wild conclusions, these strange ideas. Like I talked about this morning, this whole issue of, of uh, self-esteem. Start out well, honest. I mean, I, I don't think they truly intended anything of where it is today. The problem about it is, is that even the best intentions, when they're separated from God, they always end bad. doesn't matter how good your intentions are. If God isn't in the middle of it, follow the heart, follow the money, because that's where it's always going to go. It's always going to fall into those categories, because the heart's always going to say, I'm awesome, and the, and the, and the awesome in me is going to just want more money and want to invest and have all those things, because that's just the way it is. So how do, we, how do we get through this if we didn't have, let's say, for instance, a good good uh, concordance and a good uh, reference Bible. How would we find these verse like I find here in Genesis? Other than, like I said, memorizing the whole Old Testament. How do we do it? How do we keep from coming to conclusions, weird conclusions, for instance, like the, the, the medieval church concluded that this was Mary. It tells us right there it's a sign. Can't be Mary. Of course, she gave birth to Jesus, but this is talking about something bigger than, bigger than Mary for sure. Or they concluded that it was the church. So how did they ever conclude that it was the church? I mean, let's just re reason together. Did Jesus give, did the birth give birth, did Jesus, did the church give birth to Jesus? Or did Jesus give birth to the church? See, the simple logical, you know, run that one off pretty fast. But no, that was a position held by the church for a very long time. This is the church. The church gave birth to Jesus because Jesus is the Savior, and the church is now the Savior. Again, follow, follow the heart and the money because that's what they were getting at. Sometimes all we need to know is that we don't know enough to know. But if we follow the rules, for, number one, resist the urge to speculate. That'll keep you from coming to conclusions you didn't come to. There's nothing in here you can come up with on your own. Nothing. Not a single thing in Revelation. You'll never come to it by yourself. And I'm not saying you need Pastor Bill to interpret it. You know, I, I can't come up with anything on my own either. There's nothing in here. So we have to submit ourselves to the Word of God and to the Spirit of God. We can't come up with it on our own. We refuse the urge, resist the urge to speculate. Number two, follow the rules of interpretation. Again, it says it's a sign. It's a sign. In fact, this is the only time, the first time since chapter 4, that we've been given anything that's been called an actual sign. Everything prior to this has been literal. It's hard as it is to believe. Like I said, stars falling from heaven and falling on a third of the seas, a third of the fresh water, a third of the mankind being killed, a third of the ocean turning into blood. How can that be literal? I don't know how. I'm just saying the rules of interpretation say that's what you've got to call it. Let it be what it is. You're not smart enough. All of us together are not smart enough to figure it out any other way. So if it's not literal, it can't, it, who can, no one can know what it is. But when God tells us it's a sign, let it be what it is. I hate being in the dark. I know you do too, both in a literal and a metaphorical sense. But it's great to know the one who holds the light switch, isn't it? So when God wants you to know something, he can flip the switch on. And if he doesn't, just that's okay. It's okay to, as long as you know, I don't know, and I, at this point, I can't know. Cool. Move on to something you can. Just move on. So we're introduced again to this fourth figurative or this third figurative woman. We have the Jezebel of Revelation 2. We have the harlot of Revelation 17, the woman who rides the beast. And I believe those two are pretty much related, if not the one and the same. So it may not be three. There may, might not be four. There may be three. We'll get to that when we get to Revelation 17 this time next year. And then we have this woman who is none other than Israel. And then, of course, we have the bride of Christ. So these four female personages. Uh, chap verses 2 and 3, notice just, just, some, just some things to point out here. Uh, and she, gave, she was with child, and she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared. Notice it's a sign. So it's not, what does that mean? It's not literal. So we know later on it tells us this is the devil and in Satan. But we know for a fact because it tells us it's a sign, this is not what he looks like. So don't go off and say this is what the devil looks like because the Bible says it looks like. No, the Bible de definitely said that he does not look like this. It, this is a symbolic representation of him because you need to know what he, the way he's going to be represented in particular on the earth. 
So he had a great dragon with seven heads. I thought seven was the number of perfection. Apparently not. Unless you could say he's perfectly evil. And you hear, I hear that quite a bit. Seven's the number of perfection, number of perfection, number of perfection. Well, you have, here's, here's, a, here's one that knocks it out of the park for you. You can't do that. Seven, Satan's certainly not, not perfect. Not at all. And you're going to see that his, his, his physical representation on earth, which is going to be this beast, this antichrist, is going to also have seven, represented by seven heads. So, so these guys are perfect? No, they're far from perfect. As far as you can possibly get. So the number seven better is better understood as the number of completeness. Completely evil. Or completely right, righteous. Or completely finished. Whichever. Because the number, uh oh the revelation is full of all kinds of sevens. But one of the sevens that in here is you've got this, this dragon, this, this devil, who has seven heads. So you have to take it, you have to take it for what it is. Seven heads. He has, he, his earthly power is going to be defined by these seven heads and these ten horns. We're going to see. He starts off with, it starts off, the Antichrist regime starts off with ten kings allied together, confederated together. And that one of these ten, we're going to get to chapter 17, like I said, this time next year, maybe two years or three years from now, whenever we get there. And one of these ten is going to turn out to be the Antichrist, according to Daniel, according to Revelation 17 and other places. He's going to be one of these seven. We won't know who, to, who he is until he does a certain thing. He's going to get rid of three of them. He's going to start off with ten. He's going to remove three, which is going to leave us seven. He's one of those seven, but he's going to be ruling the seven. And in fact, in Revelation 17, it gets even more complicated than that. He's going to be a seventh and also an eighth. How can he do that? How can he be two? Because he has a phase one and he has a phase two. He has a phase one in the first three and a half years, and he has a phase two in the second three and a half years. The second three and a half years is when he becomes this supernatural Satan possessed uh, entity capable of you know enabling statues to speak and kill people and all this kind of stuff so phase one and phase two but we'll, we'll get to that so don't worry about that just yet seven diadems again these are uh, you have crowns 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 of all kinds in revelation and some are, are called diademata and other ones are called stephanos the stephanos was the crowns that you got at the end of running a hundred yard dash so you won a race, if you will. So it was a conquering crown as opposed to a diadem or a diademata, which is a ruling crown. These are diadems. So how does Satan have a complete number of ruling crowns? Well, again, Scripture answers the question for us. If you'll recall, by the way, it's the same kind of type of crowns. It says many crowns on the head of Christ in chapter 19. We read that. He has many diadems on his head. These ruling crowns, ruling all the nations and all the peoples and all the tongues, tribes, and, and cultures. Uh, but this, this entity called Satan has seven heads and has seven diadems on these ten horns. What does this mean? How does he rule? Well, if you recall in Jesus' temptation, here's one of the places how we can interpret this or understand this. So in Jesus' temptation, he brings four temptations against Jesus. One of the temptations is that he takes him to a very high mountain, shows him all the nations of the world in an instant. How does he do that? I don't know. I just, like I said, take it for what it is. It says that he did that. So I'm under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Luke says that he does that, so I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. But he does do that nonetheless. And he says, all these I will give to you. He says this to Jesus. Because they have been given to me. In other words, the power to rule has been given to me, and I will give them to you if you will bow down. And the interesting thing is that Jesus doesn't contradict that. The only thing Jesus contradicts about the whole thing is him bowing down to him. He says, no, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Get behind me, Satan, right? But he doesn't contradict the fact that he has the capacity to offer him the rule of these nations. He doesn't contradict that. So it shouldn't surprise us that this entity, Satan, this, this sign here, has among his symbols at least these, this complete number of ruling crowns because it's been given to him. We gave it to him. It was by default. We sinned in the garden. We had the rule. Uh, when we defaulted, it went to him. So that's where we are today. And we've been there for a very long time. So there's, a, there's the diadems. We can learn more about him and more about who he is. And why don't we go there and, and do a little bit of this? We, we looked at some of that this morning in, in Isaiah 14. Let's go to the Old Testament. Hold your place. Got your good old bookmark. Now let's flip back to Ezekiel 28 and learn a little bit, a little bit more lesson about prophecy and kind of the way 
uh, God inspires and what he does in that inspiration and how prophecy can be confusing. And if we kind of know the ropes, sort of, we can expect these kind of things to happen. And it get, makes it a little bit easier on us when we come across another prophecy. Uh, and there's a number of them that are like this. Ezekiel 28, what happens here is gives us a good lesson. Like I said, one of the unusual characteristics of prophecy, the prophet is here focusing on a local and immediate event or person. And in the process of the conversation or the process of the, the statement that he's making about this event or person, it trails off into something that obviously doesn't apply to an immediate person or, or a physical entity at all. Consider what it says here. Ezekiel 28, we're going to read down through verse 19, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, thus says the Lord God. So this is some physical guy who's a king in Tyre, Tyre's this, this uh, port city on, in Phoenicia and on the coast of Lebanon. Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you said, I am a God. Now that's not unusual. I've, there's been plenty of men and, and women who've ruled on thrones who claim to be God. All the Caesars thought they were gods. Nebuchadnezzar, he, at least at some point, was full of himself. I sit at the seat of gods in the heart of the sea. So it sounds like a statement that would be made by the Phoenician king. Yet you are a man, God says, and not a god. So this is still talking about some local, local guy. Although you make your heart like the heart of God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no seeker that is matching in you. Wait a minute. Now, we've gotten further. So all of a sudden, we started giving these guys, God starts giving this guy credit for things that I don't know anybody could get. God's talking about somebody else. Very quickly, you're going to see the change. By your wisdom and understanding, you had acquired riches for yourself. You acquired gold and silver or treasures. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches. Your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God. Therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you and the most ruthless of nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to the pit. You will die the death of those who are slain in the heart of the seas. Uh, Will you, will you still say, I am a God in the presence of your slayer, although you are a man and not God in the hands of those who wound you? You will die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lament against the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. You had the seal of perfection. Hold on. Ever known a man perfect? There's only been one. So we cease to talk about some physical entity. No man here. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. I'm talking about some transcendent creature here. Not the king of Tyre. The guy only lived seven or eighty years. He wasn't in Eden, the garden of God. Adam and Eve were the only human beings in, the, in Eden, the garden of God. So we're not talking about a human being here. Who, who is this? Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, the emerald, the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day that you were created. So he is a created creature, but he's not human. You were the anointed cherub who covers, uh-oh, cherubim, that's a, that's a supernatural creature. It's got a bunch of wings and eyes all over him, four different sets of hands and stuff. And I placed you there. You were in the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until the unrighteousness was found in you. But the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence. And you sinned, therefore I cast you out as profane from the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by the reason of your splendor and cast to the ground. You put to, you, I put you before kings that, you, that they may see you, the multitude of your iniquities and righteousness of your trading, where it kind of bleeds back now into a local entity again. So we go from a, a man to something obviously that is not a man. In fact, God says he's anything but a man. He's a cherub. He was perfect. He was in the Garden of Eden. He was all these things. It's definitely not the king of Tyre, right? We've gone from talking about the king of Tyre to apparently talking about something, an entity that's behind the king of Tyre. The one that's really running the show, pulling the strings, the puppet strings, it's actually Satan himself. So we have it there. Let's go to, let's go to Isaiah and see a little bit more of what we saw this morning. Isaiah 14. So notice the change. So we, we went from this physical, local entity, human being, king of Tyre, bled into this entity, spiritual being who's been around for a very long time, even the Garden of Eden, who was behind him. And then it went back into, we've read a little bit further there, and went back into talking about this local king who's God's going to judge. 
And so, anyway, it's just important to see that. Chapter 14 of Isaiah, verse, verse 1. Let's go to verse 4. Take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. That's a physical entity, right? That's a human being. How the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of rulers. And he did that. He put an end to Babylon. Which used to strike the people in the fury and unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger and with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth in shouts of joy. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were laid low, now the tree cutters come up against us. So it's, it's talking about this, uh, uh, again, the king, of, the king of Babylon and all the stuff that he did. Shell beneath you from beneath is excited over you to meet you when you come. It arouses for, your, for you the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth, all raised. It raised all the kings of the nations from their thrones. They, they will all respond and say to you, even you have been made weak as we, and we have, you've become like one of us. Your pomp and your music and your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you. Pretty, pretty awesome stuff there. Worms are your covering. Ooh, getting hungry. How have you fallen from heaven? Now you've got this major shift here. He had a conversation about a literal human being with physical body, and he rotted, and he maggots ate him, and then boom, we go to something that isn't physical. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of morning, which is the word Lucifer in Hebrew, son of the dawn. We saw it on the screen this morning. You've been cut down to the earth. You've been weakened. You, we, you who weaken the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of, of the assembly of the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be brought down and thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. And those who see you will gaze on you and they will ponder over you saying, is this not the man who made the earth? So we're going back and forth from man to spiritual entity and then back to man. And why does God do stuff like that? I don't know, just because he can. But you got to take it. you got to learn from it. Again, part of, the, part of the things you learn from this is that behind these leaders is always something spiritual. It's always. It's always. Like I said, I've said it many times. So you're, you're telling me the devil's messing with you, and I'm saying I doubt it. I'm not saying it can't be a demon, but I'm just saying, no offense, I don't think you're that important. I just don't think you are. Because he can only be in one place at one time, and if I was him, I wouldn't mess with you. Because I'm not going to get enough mileage out of you. I'm going to be with heads of state. I'm going to be with presidents. I'm going to be with power brokers. I'm going to be with those who have a button that they can mash and nuke the whole world. Or uh, have power and say over large, tremendous amounts of ungodly wealth. That's where I would be if I was Satan. I'm not very smart. Now, I guarantee he's way smarter than we are. And I promise you, he's in places like that. He's not with us. He's in places like this. The power broker, so the king of Tyre, who's having all this trade. The king of Babylon, who is this one world ruler. Uh, wow. Um, that's I informative. So, so let's get back to Revelation. It's just a picture. We have, we're getting pictures there of this entity that we're reading about here, Satan, his his symbolic representation that we have here, and uh, filling in some blanks, and uh, we're going to move on from that. So, seven heads, right? Okay. Can't be perfection, certainly can't. So we have this grand birth, uh, not without opposition. Like I said, you have this, this entity, Satan, standing, waiting to devour this child. So we know who the woman is. She's, she's Israel. Who does she give birth to? The one who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. We already know who he is. His name is Jesus. So, but notice, what is Satan trying to do? Well, he's trying to kill him. He's trying to stop the birth process. Anything. Why? Because he knows who this is. He knows exactly who this is. And uh, he's very scared of him. Easier to kill him as a baby than any other way. Or easier to kill off, even better, the people who are going to bring him into this world which is what we see consistently throughout history. There was war declared back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. You remember the war? God speaking in, in a curse in the Garden of Eden. Here we have the entity that was there, this cherub who covers, who came in the, in the physical representation of a snake. 
deceiving the woman and the man, and then they fell, and then now God's going to pronounce a curse on all three of them. I will make you the enemies of you and the woman, this cherub, former cherub. Two of you are going to be enemies. That's why women don't like snakes. No, that's not the reason, but this is it's bigger than that. And of your offspring and her descendant, this is, this is a new American standard. I, some of you, most of you here in, in her seed, but actually new American standard is taking quite a bit of liberty here to interpret this this way. It's actually accurate. And it's not because it agrees with my theology, just actually very accurate because this is really what it focuses on. It tells us later on in the New Testament, this seed that's speaking of is singular, speaking of the Messiah who was to come. So and your offspring, so it's speaking about a specific offspring of Satan, and a specific offspring of, of this woman. And, of course, Satan's ultimate offspring is the Antichrist, and the woman's ultimate offspring, her descendant, is none other than the Christ himself. He shall bruise you on the head. That's a deadly blow to a snake. And you shall bruise him on the heel. That's a, bat. That's a deadly blow to a human being from a snake, right? So both in both cases are going to die. But one resurrects, right? We know him. He's, he's, he's the one who's going to rule the world with a rod of iron. So the war has been declared. The devil fights to keep this birth from happening. He knows it's going to happen because it's been told him here. He knows it. He's, he's scared of this descendant. And I want you to notice very carefully, he takes God very seriously. He takes him very literally. I'm not saying learn, you should learn a lot from the devil, but in this case, you really need to. Because he's setting a great example of how you ought to interpret God. You ought to take him very seriously and very literally. He says exactly what he means. It means exactly what he says. The devil knows that. So... It's, like I said, a good lesson in symbolism here and how the Bible works. It's not literally a red dragon chasing Israelis around, but uh, all over the planet. Instead, it's a spiritual entity that's empowering these leaders that we've seen here in, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. Empowering these leaders, empowering these armies. He's the mind behind them. Manipulating them, causing them to do the things they do. In particular, hunt down the Jews. For instance, you have all the way back in uh, Exodus, you have the story of Pharaoh throwing and commanding the people to throw all the Jewish male babies into the Nile. Was that actually Pharaoh? Yeah, of course it was. He was a real Pharaoh. He was a real God. But what was behind him? Now, now you know. It wasn't just people being bad. Not just. There was actually spiritual power behind it. You know who it is now. He knows this. The only way to get rid of this one, this male descendant who was coming, is to kill all the male descendants, right? Wow, that makes sense. It does. And then you have Haman in the book of Esther trying to wipe out all the Jews, sets a date, right? Cast the purr, these dice, and decides on a date to kill, to annihilate, to destroy all the Jews in the known world, which is the whole world that the, that the, that the Persian world Persian king ruled. And so he got the hand, he got the upper hand, he got the power to do all this. And of course, all that is undone by, by providence, of course, of course, in the book of Esther. And then, of course, you have Herod. Who, what does he do to all the babies in Bethlehem? Was that Herod that did that? Yeah, he's responsible for his decisions, but you understand there's a spiritual entity behind this. Very powerful one. Very purposeful. And you, you can look at the history of the Jews, you can see constantly, uh, nobody's been hunted down more than Jews. Now you know why. Now you know why. He, he, he hates them because he knows what's coming from them. The one who's going to destroy him is coming from the Jews, so why not destroy the Jews to keep that from happening? And so he's been at it. So you can explain the Second World War and the Holocaust and all that uh, through, largely through that. He hates them, absolutely desperately so. Uh, but back to the whole issue here. Does the devil actually look like a dragon? Of course he does not. He doesn't have seven heads. He doesn't have ten horns. It tells us here that it's a symbol, right? So verse 4. These stars, let's take a look at those. And his tail swept away a third. That's actually a number. We don't know what the number is because we don't know what the original is, but whatever the original is, it's one third of that. So it's a percentage. It's an actual number. God knows the number. We don't have the number. It's nowhere in the Bible. No sense in looking for it. Their tail, his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. What are these? So these actual celestial beings, celestial uh, bodies like stars? No, again, it was, it was already told us this is a sign. These aren't literal stars. They're figurative, and we've already been introduced to these. And I've already told you here in Revelation, stars quite often referring to angels. So we have, and we're told here down in verse 7, and there was a war and with Michael, and Michael and his angels waging a war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. And then verse 9, also the same thing. He was thrown down to the earth, along with his angels were also thrown down to the earth. That's who these stars are. So whatever original number we had of the angels, one-third of them followed him. He didn't fall by himself. He deceived a third more. Uh, a th I should say a third of the angels. Remember, he's not an angel. He's a cherub. 
So whatever original number we had, we don't know what that number is, but we know, we, we can know this. We can interpret, for instance, from Hebrews 12, 22, it tells us that the, angel, the remaining angels, whatever two-thirds that number is, was an innumerable number of angels. Can't count them. So what is one-third of that? A, a bunch. It's a bunch. There's a bunch of demons. Some of them are down there. Some of them are still up here. The ones down there are going to be released according to, as we saw in chapter 8 and other places. Add to that the fact that this powerful, influential entity, Satan, has focused attention on the people of God. That would be us. And plus the fact that he's brought down greater and better people than us. Plus the fact that not only that, but Michael the archangel does not rebuke him. Instead, he says to the Lord, the Lord rebuke you in Jude, right? And add to that also the fact that this same entity, the devil, is aligned against us and is aggressively so. It should bring a little bit of sobriety and uh, uh, alertness to us, I would suggest to you. He's very much real. He's not a symbol. Very much real. He's just not physical. We consider physical to be reality, and it's actually not. Not, not any more than anything else. Verse 5 and 6, and it's at this point we're going to be introduced to something here. There's an introduction here that's, there's a fast forward here that's very instructive. And it gets us a little bit deeper into, I've been saying all along, it's almost like you can take Revelation and pull it out of the Old Te New Testament and paste it to the back of the, uh, pull, take it out of the New Testament, paste it in the back of the Old Testament, and you're not going to miss anything. In fact, it may help you. Because here's, here's one of the places that we're going to have a fast, there's going to be a 2,000 year fast forward in chapters 5, I mean, in, here in chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. She gave birth to a son. Who's she? Israel, who's the son? Jesus, a male child who is the ruler of the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and thrown. So there's an implied at least 32 year gap right there, right? Jesus wasn't born to go straight to heaven. He was born 32 years, died as a sacrifice for our sins, resurrected, spent 40 days with the disciples, ascended into heaven, right? There he goes to the throne of God, okay? So there's an implied 32 year gap there, but notice what the very next, the very next verse, verse 6, and a woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for, who's the woman? Israel. Fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for her by God so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days. That's the time period, that's half the time of, of the tribulation, the very end times. So we've gone all the way from Jesus being born and ascending into heaven 32 years later, right? Fast forward through 2,000 years, even, the, even where we are today, to the very end times, and I would tell you even the last, this is just going to tell you where we are, the last, the, the, this 1,260 days is actually the last half of the seven years of tribulation. That's what you're, that's what you're looking at here. We fast forward through 2,000 years? Where's the church in all this? Not, not only is the church not here, the church age is not here at all. You basically just blip through the whole thing. But through all of our years, all the previous centuries of all the church and all the things we went through, so does God not consider this an important time? Well, most definitely does. But what you've just read there is what you consistently read when you read the Old Testament about this time. This time of the Old Testament does not exist. It is a mystery, Paul says. It is basically, it is, it is, this is exactly the way numerous times the Old Testament reads. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to live. He's going to die. And then he's going to resurrect. And then he's going to conquer the whole world and rule all the world from Jerusalem. That's the way it reads. No church period mentioned at all. Why? Because God just simply cuts that part out. He does not reveal it to his prophets. He leaves it as a mystery. He does not reveal it until the New Testament comes, until the church is inaugurated. We're basically in a, in a parenthesis in history right now. A parenthesis in which we don't know how long it's going to be. The, 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 Jew, the Jewish period is very codified. 490, uh, uh, 77 have been decreed for you, he says the angel Gabriel to you and your people, right? That's the exact amount of time. That's 490 years. 483 of those years ticked off to the day, leaving a seven-year period in Daniel, remember? And that seven-year period somehow has been detached now in this parenthesis. And this parenthesis can, is, is existing for we don't know how long. As long as the grace of God exists, as long as he withholds his wrath upon the earth, he's got a time period for it. We just don't know how long that is. And in fact, Jesus says when he was on the earth, neither does the Son of Man know when that time is. But only the Father, not the angels, not the Son, only the Father. Of course, Revelation, now we have, at least we're told what's going to happen in the end, but we're not even told the time. 
But you're in this parenthetical time that has no, it's almost as if God had a watch on his arm called Israel. And as soon as Jesus resurrects and ascends, the watch comes off, he lays it upside down or pulls the little plug on the end so that, so that it doesn't run on the battery or whatever. And then now we're in this time where no time ticks off at all. It's just not nebulous, but it's almost seemingly nebulous. We're just waiting for God to do something. And, and he is, he definitely is. But you have, again, you have this picture here. It's pictured here in this fast forward. It goes straight. They, the church doesn't even exist seemingly so. It goes straight from his death, resurrection, and ascension, straight to the end times. Of course, we know that's not true. We know it's not true because the rest is not just this. We know it because the rest of the New Testament. It's not just experiential. It's not. It actually is part of prophecy, but it was hidden from the prophets of the Old Testament. So, so here we are. So it tells us here in verses 5 and 6, this one who's coming is going to rule them with a rod of, rule the nations with a rod of iron. Again, how do we interpret this? How do we know? It's not the picture of Jesus that I had. The picture I have of Jesus is this, this uh, self-sacrificing servant of God who lays down his life, who, who will not even uh, uh, snuff out a wick or, or break a bruised reed. I thought that was the Jesus that we knew. And I would remind you, yes, it is the Jesus that you know, but it's not all who Jesus is. This book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's stuff you couldn't have known otherwise. If all you knew about Jesus is his sacrifice, his sacrificial death and resurrection, you only know part of who he is. What you're finding out or going to be finding out here in the Revelation is Jesus is also a warrior to bring about the vengeance of God, full of the wrath of God. It may not be your, like I said, it's not your picture of the Jesus sitting in a green field stroking a lamb. And, you know, I, I'm so sorry. That's not the whole picture of who Jesus is. And, and again, we have this whole picture, uh, uh, this whole imagery of him ruling the nations with a rod of iron. It's already, again, nothing new in Revelation. It's already been told to us. Look at, look at this, Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a, a really awesome psalm. You basically have the narrator who's the Holy Spirit, and you have the Father and the Son in an antiphonal conversation all the way through. The son asks a question, the father answers a question, the son asks, the father answers, the son asks, the father promises, and the Holy Spirit is narrating the whole thing. It's pretty cool. Really short, short little psalm, but really cool. Ask it of me, God, the father speaking to the son, and I will certainly give the nations as your inheritance. Notice, not just Israel. And the ends of the earth as your possession, you shall notice. Break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Not your picture of who Jesus was, probably. I had a lady who said to me, well, that's just really offensive to me. And my, you know what I told her? I said, well, you're not near as offended as you're going to be when we get to the rest of the Revelation, because, man, is he's going to do that in spades. The blood's going to be so deep, by the time we get to chapter 20, it's going to be four feet deep, the whole land of Israel. Who does that? Jesus, 100%. No one else. All the armies that come with him are just there to watch. Jesus does all that. Not your picture of Jesus. Like I said, you're going to have to adjust your picture. I don't know what to tell you. I didn't write this, so there you go. Obviously, an implied gap here. Like I said, this 2,000 years of, of church history that's just sort of uh, pushed right through, and uh, we, have, we have to deal with it there, and it's, just, it's, it's left there for us. Um, it, it, we, are, we were given that. So, so back, let's go back to what's happening here. So, 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 well, let's read it, in fact. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Oh, wait, that woman is Israel. There's only one way wilderness can go. Wilderness can be anywhere if you live here. In fact, we live here. Wilderness is to the east, or just to the west of us. You go east, you go, you know, it's the ocean over there. It's not wilderness over there. Wilderness is to the west. There's a lot of the Chihuahuan Desert. It's not very far. Or I guess it is, but not very far. You get into really bad Texas desert, I can assure you that. But for, for an Israeli, for a Jew, east, I mean, uh, it, it, the wilderness is always a direction. It's always, wet, it's always east. So the woman fled into the wilderness, that's east, where she had a place, and more often than not, south and east. South and east towards the Dead Sea and across the Dead Sea into Edom and Saudi Arabian Peninsula, massive wilderness, massive trackless wilderness and desert over there. That's the way they refer to it. And so when you see this, you have the Holy Spirit inspiring this through a Jewish man, John, and John would have known exactly what you're talking about. Now you do. Woman fled in the wilderness 
where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be nourished 1,260 days. Like I said, exactly half of the tribulation. I believe it's the last half, because what's the good of protecting her for the first half and then turning her loose and letting her get killed for the second half? It doesn't make sense. So, so something's happening here. And what's, it, again, our gaps have already, the, uh, this, this fleeing has already been explained to us in Old Testament. Again, nothing new in Revelation, almost nothing. Here's Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. It's talking about a literal event that's on the horizon of Israel, still even yet today. On that day, his feet, the previous verse tells us his feet is God's feet. God's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. I've been there. It's a literal place. It's to the east of Jerusalem. It's the higher mountain. Jerusalem, Mount Zion is like a little low mountain kind of down in the middle of a valley. The, the Mount of Olives is quite a bit higher. Notice it says his feet will stand there. It's this mountain chain basically that runs from north to south. He, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and it will be, the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west. This mountain runs from north to south, so split it east to west is just like cut it like a big loaf of bread. Chop it right in the middle forming a very large valley. Half, by the way, interestingly enough, geologically they found there is a rift that runs right underneath that, uh, that mountain, right up, to the, right up to the door of Jerusalem. It's, you know, coincidental, I know, because you don't believe the Bible any more than I do, right? Half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south, and you will flee by the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel, that's south and east. Same what he's told this Israel's going to be doing for 1260 days. Fleeing south and east. Yes, you will flee just as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Again, they're just watching. The Lord is going to be doing all the work. He's going to be doing all the, all the warfare. And of course, uh, that, that Zechariah chapter 14 is very, very graphic. The destruction he's going to be doing to the armies that are surrounding Israel and attacking them. And the fact that they're protected in the midst of all that. Again, we have all this. We're taking all together as this total body of evidence and kind of making this whole case uh, together here. So it kind of fills in the blanks for us. And I recommend the whole chapter to you. If you want to hear more about what happens in Armageddon, that's, that's probably more descriptive than anything in Revelation, I would suggest. So, and a, lot, a lot of stuff, again, in Revelation, there's a lot of stuff left out. Because, again, Revelation assumes you know the Old Testament very well. Because he's already, God has already said a bunch of this stuff, and he's just sending you on certain little errands like this. So she's going to flee to the wilderness? Of course she is. We've already been told in the whole chapter 14 of Zechariah she's going to do that. In fact, what's going to happen to the armies that follow her, and how God's going to stop them, and what's going to happen in the whole process. And uh, so of course, south and east is, is today the country of Jordan. And then past that is Saudi Arabia. So when we go to Israel, which is where we're headed there, by the way, this fall, God willing, we get to go this time. We often go and land in Israel, and then we will cross over into Jordan and go to an area called Petra. And Petra is famous if you watch the Indiana Jones series, you know, on, on, in movies. One of his movies was filmed there in Petra. It's a really cool place. And it's got, all it is is a bunch of tombs. Uh, and, but it's cool. It's really cool. You basically just had a bunch of rich Arabs that had a ton of money and nothing to spend it on. And so they, had, they would hire architects from, from Greece and Rome to carve tombs for them. And that's where they spent all their money because they, they just had a ton of money. And, you know, like I said, it's like having a ton of money on a desert island. It doesn't mean anything. So you have to find somebody to come spend their money on. So, so, they, they, so we go to Petra this year. When we land, we're going to be actually landing in Jordan and spending a couple of days in Jordan because, you know, three-quarter or half of Jordan belonged to Israel biblically. Uh, three tribes were over across the Jordan River, which is now the land of Transjordan or, or Jordan as it's called. So we're going to go over there. We're going to see Mount Nebo. We're going to get to see the Petra and maybe um, that over there also is where this pillar of salt is. So they claim is, uh, is Lot's wife. So let's see. That's going to be cool. So I'm going to take a little pinch off of her and, and taste and see what it tastes like. <laughs> no. I bet they would frown on that. I don't know. So we'll stop right there. Do you have questions? The church does not exist. Here's the question from Annie at 12, 5, I don't know what that means. But anyway, oh, 12, 5, the verse, all right. So the church does not exist at this point. 
It, it's not revealed. Is it, is it in the parenthesis? No, it's just, it's, it's not that the, uh, the church exist, did the church exist then or not? It exists, it did not, it, it does exist then, but the way I understand it, the church exists at this point in heaven. So at the point where Michael, the archangel, is throwing Satan out of heaven, and the woman is fleeing to the wilderness for the second half of the seven-year tribulation. The church is already up there. She's already in heaven. Yes, she exists, but she exists in, in her, at least, uh, the, 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 she's in the presence of her Savior, at least at that time. So, so yeah, the church exists, and the church is existing today. It's just that she's in a parenthesis, and that parenthesis was hidden. It's like a, a mist that was over the eyes of the Old Testament prophets. They were not, it was not revealed to them. And in fact, it, Peter says, they longed to see the things that we now know. And uh, they knew the things that they were saying somehow or another explained something, but they just didn't get it. And it's not that the church isn't at all in the Old Testament. It's just very, very hard to find. It's certainly not revealed. It's only from a position of a New Testament interpreter with the Holy Spirit can you actually see them. But you can easily see how without that, you had no New Testament, you would never see the church. An Isaiah would have never seen the church, a Jeremiah, an Ezekiel, great men. But God wouldn't tell them stuff like that because God can withhold information if he wants to. So, so there you go. So, nothing else? All right, I hope I answered their question. I couldn't get a rebuttal, so there you go. Good, it's a great, that's of my favorite ones. Something else? Perfectly clear, right? Lots of information. We stopped here at the half of the chapter because, like I said, it's pretty thick. And we have some more, uh, half, another half for us to consider next week. And so we'll be doing that uh, next time. Okay? All right, good to go. Shall we pray? God, we thank you for the things that you're teaching us. We thank you for how we can learn, Lord, and um, that you're sovereign. You can do whatever you want to. You don't, don't owe us any information. And what we have has come to us through grace. And um, we're not deserving of it, uh, but you have decided to give it to us because you love us. And uh, you want us to know things. And so, Lord, help us to know. Uh, Lord, help us to understand. Help us to get a grasp of, of these things and get a grasp of your word so that we can be better at it and we can be useful to you. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.